<laughs> we be live. <laughs> I have to say it like Armin says it, even though he's not here, because today it's girls takeover. Okay. <laughs> it's girls takeover and it's going to be a lot of fun. So hi, everyone. Um, you know me. I'm Susanna. I'm your uh, CEO. And today with me, I have Alice Gretchen and Alice <laughs> is the author of Wayward, a memoir of uh, spiritual warfare and sexual purity. And um, she was nice enough to send me a copy and I freaking loved this book. And so I wanted to talk about it, but well, oh my gosh, there are so many things in this book I wanna talk about. <laughs> um, so many different things. Um, but what I wanted to focus on because it hasn't been, well, let me put it this way. Like when I was even years after like coming out of my faith, um, there was still so much that I carried with me and I didn't know how to recover from sexual shame. And it was something that I would like just search for videos on more information on. And I never really found what I was looking for. And um, it just made me feel like so alone, you know? But this book, I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> there were so many, oh my God, um, moments where I was, I was just, I really, I felt it. And I was like, she understands, you know? And oh, the shame is so real. It's so real. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and because I haven't really been around a lot of people who articulate it the way that you articulate it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about today because I thought it would be helpful for a lot of different people. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. And thank you for send me, sending me your book. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thanks for reading it. <laughs> yeah. Guys, I highly recommend it. When is your audiobook coming out? So my audiobook is coming out at some point this spring. I'm in the middle of like figuring out just a few more things on the logistical end with like mastering and distribution, mm -hmm. but it should be out very soon. So awesome. I'll be I'll be sharing about it on the the socials and my website. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um and so guys, I put a link to this book in the description and also all of Alice's, you know, ways you can follow her and also for her organization dare to doubt which i think we'll touch on a little bit at the end um and i didn't even mention that you're an accomplished actress <laughs> <laughs> oh you know sorry there's a siren no, it's fine. Fire, we can hear that um yeah yeah i've been in i've been in la since i was like right after I turned 17 and it's, I'm still here. I'm 35 and I'm still here. So it's yeah. Acting ebbs and flows, just like most creative livings. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I think one thing that struck me as I read this book, like I have, I, I started to pick up on a lot of themes and so what's so interesting is the book opens with a chapter called The Lord's Army. And it basically opens with phobia indoctrination. This scene of being trained to be a little soldier for the Lord. And I knew the song. The uh, song about being in the Lord's Army. Yeah. And um, so throughout the book, I noticed this theme of like, you know, uh where the phobia indoctrination touched you, this this theme of like fear of punishment. And then I started to just circle all the different times where shame or guilt were brought up. Ooh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to see your coffee just to see <laughs> I know, I got like all these notes. There's so much of it. That's that's what drove me. Yeah. And um I I was like, I relate so much. Like, um, and it was very gratifying to see on a page. And of course, I mean that in a way of like relating to someone, not like I'm yeah. glad you went through that. <laughs> no, I know um, what you mean. And 
I think it was really helpful because um, I don't think people who didn't grow up with like a really faith based community or family unit, like understand how much that becomes part of your sense of self, Mm -hmm. you know, like this, this lens that you see yourself in relation to Mm -hmm. this, this kind of ideal that you're always guilty and ashamed that you're not meeting. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was curious about like your experience when you leave faith, but you still carry all these things. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was so frustrating to me because I would know where this was coming from. I knew that it wasn't something I believed in anymore, but it was still something I hated myself for. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel like I know exactly what you mean. And so, you know, first to just disclaim, I'm not an expert. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just someone who wrote a book about my <laughs> own experience. And as, if I recall correctly, you're ex-Catholic, right? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm ex like evangelical charismatic. So like slight different, but still under the umbrella of, of Christianity. So for me, that was one of the hardest parts about losing my faith was no one told me that just because you lose your faith, as corny as this is going to sound, doesn't mean your faith loses you in in some ways. Like it is, especially for people who grow up in it. It's one thing to um, join a religion or any sort of group, any sort of community when you're a fully formed adult and your brain's developed and you can sort of like naturally without even thinking too hard about it, sort of filter out the things that just don't ring with truth to you or, oh, you know, that's a little hellfire and brimstone. I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on this. Like I I write in my book that that's how it was for my mom. My mom converted to Christianity as an adult. And I didn't find out until a couple years ago that she never believed in hell, which just blew my mind because (laughs) that was the bottom line of everything to me was like, that's the only reason I stayed in as long as I did. Mm -hmm. Um, And I stayed in, I was 17 when I really got the rug pulled out from under me and was like, whoa, it was the first time I had a crisis of faith, but I didn't really leave it until I was um, 21. So a a few years later, and that's when I just found myself an atheist, a reluctant atheist, I say, but I'm really happy about it now. But yeah, what the, 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 one of the hardest parts though, wasn't just losing my sense of purpose, my, my sense of meaning, my uh, certain social circles that I was a part of. Like it wasn't, those were difficult to be sure, but it was also being confronted with like religious trauma. I Mm. had debilitating symptoms of religious trauma. And um, that's sort of, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with religious trauma, Um, but basically it's like, I was having really bad panic attacks. And at first I didn't know why. And years later I would piece together, oh my gosh, my panic attack started two months after I became an atheist and just couldn't believe in God anymore because he failed a test. I tested God and I knew I wasn't supposed to, but I had to. And it was from such this like earnest wanting him to be real place. It wasn't like a cocky, like, all right, God do this. It was like, no, I desperately needed him to be real, but nothing happened. And uh, I, it, it wasn't until I learned about religious trauma syndrome many years later that I saw that one of the symptoms of religious trauma syndrome, which very closely resembles complex PTSD, mm-hmm. um, is panic attacks, self-harm, could be hallucinations. Like there's 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 all of these symptoms and it can affect everyone a little differently. Like people who have struggled with religious trauma can, um, it can manifest in everyone a little bit differently. But for me, it was like, I had so many triggers that would easily go off um, and even though it was so confusing as even though I didn't believe in hell anymore, what I learned was that my body and my brain still believed in hell and mm-hmm. definitely thought that I was going there now. Um, and it didn't make sense to me the same way the, the grief aspect of losing my faith didn't make sense to me. It's like, how do you grieve someone who was never there? How do you mm-hmm. like, how do you more, how, how do I mourn the heavenly father that was 
real to me in a sense, intellectually. I never experienced God. I never heard from God. I never got slain by the spirit or any of these other markers um, that were common in my community uh, with people who did claim to hear from God. So God never talked to me or anything. So I didn't necessarily, he wasn't real to me in an experiential level, mm -hmm. but on an intellectual level, very much so. And every micro decision in my life was based off of what I thought he wanted me to do. And so losing my faith, it just left all these gaping holes of like, where, what do I do with this grief? What do I do with this anger? What do I do with this fear? What do I do with the shame? Because I know that I'm free now. I have nothing mm -hmm. to be for. I, I can have sex with whoever I want, for instance, you know, like I can read any book that I want. I can watch any movie. I can wear any outfit or bikini I want, but there's still so much shame um, that for me, what, what I did, and I was just stumbling my way, my way through this because this was like, uh, 2007, 2008. Um, and I, terms like religious trauma, I'd never heard of before. I didn't know, I'd, I'd never heard of ex-Christian online support groups, you know, or resource sites like Atheist Republic or like the Freedom From Religion Foundation or Recovering From Religion. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, some of these didn't even exist back then. And so I felt very alone in it. And so in me just kind of, kind of stumbling my way through recovery and trying to like heal myself from shame, even though I didn't consciously know that's what I was doing, I found rebellion to be the best fucking medicine. And I understand it's not going to work for everyone maybe, but for me, me healing from shame, first of all, meant, um, so I've, I've been in the entertainment industry my entire adult life. I've always modeled and acted. The first, the first thing that I did in rebellion, which I, I read about in the book, was I did a topless photo shoot. Yes, I want to talk about that. <laughs> yes. So that that shoot for me, and again, this I understand will not be effective or helpful for everyone. You do you. But for for me, like I was like, yeah, fuck purity culture. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. no, like I'm not gonna be, I'm I'm not gonna like let other people tell me what I can and can't do with my body anymore because I I'd, I'd very much bought into the the lie of purity culture which was that if you wait faithfully for your future spouse and body heart and mind God's going to reward you with this incredible romance that didn't happen for me and we can talk about that later but I don't know um, oh I want to talk about that too yeah there's so many different levels yeah, <laughs> yeah but but we'll, we'll we'll come back to that basically the, I felt very betrayed by a purity culture and the promises that it held for me and the betrayals that ended up happening. And so in an act of rebellion, I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do this topless shoot. It's artistic. I don't care. You know, like, <laughs> it's just very like defiant. And I felt so liberated in ways that I wasn't even expecting. Like I knew I was doing it as sort of like a big middle finger to the church teachings that I'd grown up with, but I was totally unprepared for like, the, the healing that occurred because of that first shoot. And then I also started um, pole dancing uh, in class. And like, I've, I've never done it publicly, but I always kind of wanted to, I always kind of wanted to participate in a pole dancing competition um, just for fun. And like, I never got that good that I, that I would enter, but it was an option point to say, like, if you do dance in public, good on you. Like, no, <laughs> for me, I didn't, but good on me. You know, I did what, yeah, was, yeah, what, yeah. Was what I was comfortable with. And um, that really helped a lot, too. And I found that for me, being in my body helped rewire my mind um, and helped create new neural pathways to like, um, it used to be, you know, if I saw myself looking sexy or feeling sexy in lingerie or a swimsuit, I would feel shame, yeah. um, you know, or guilt, you know, of like, oh, you know, I shouldn't be vain. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I definitely shouldn't flaunt. I shouldn't encourage lust, you know, like there were all these things, um, all these hangups I had around feeling sexy or wanting to feel sexy. And so I just kind of dove into that feeling that whatever helped make me feel sexy, whatever it was, um, without judging it. Uh, and, letting my giving myself permission to feel good in whatever made me feel sexy really helped um mm. maybe it won't for everyone but for me it really 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 helped um rewire some some patterns of of shame and there's like yeah again there's so many layers we can get into with 
<laughs> with all this. I know, I could talk to you forever. <laughs> well, it's so interesting what you say about the rebellion thing, because like, um, looking back on my own experience, like I went through a little bit of a period of that, like in throughout college, mostly like the beginning of college, um, where like, you know, my first time living by myself, you know, out of a, my Catholic household, like I just was out here. And <laughs> um, the thing is, I think that I was in your book when you talk about recovering from other aspects of like religious trauma, you kind of talk about like um, self-driven exposure therapy, so to speak. And you know, it's interesting you say that because I mean, I, I've studied psychology for years and so I was very familiar with this concept. So I kind of took my rebellion in that form, but I, it didn't work for me as well. Mm. Like I would go do these things and then be scared and like close myself off for months because the experience of shame that I would have afterwards was utterly crippling to like my sense of self. And yeah. so that it was so funny though, because if you'd known me during that time, like outwardly, you would think I was a very sex positive person, but I think I was just trying to fake it till I make it. Sure. You know, like, cause inside I was like, I am horrible. Like, <laughs> and it's so, it's so interesting to see like how other people handle that type of situation because um, like doing it, just kind of trying to do my own exposure therapy, like by myself, like I wasn't, I wasn't doing that well at all. You know, like it wasn't until I really sat down with my therapist, like, a few years ago and I was like there's I really need to fix something because mm -hmm. it, this, is, this is in fact <laughs> Alice <laughs> my, <laughs> my therapist is I've known her for like 10 years she's one of the best people in my life and um one day I was having a session with her and she's like Susanna um you I'm mandating that you date people <laughs> I'm like what and she's like yeah like you have to this isn't you have to like and i'm like why no <laughs> and she was so right though like when it was in a structured setting um instead of me just like spinning out into oblivion of anxiety <laughs> like, yeah. um it was it was so helpful for me because she's like you're not going to be able to work through this unless you get practice and you do it consistently and have someone that you can like process things with. Mm. And so for me, that was a huge way that I was able to help recover from this sexual shame that like very few people um, that I've talked to, I'm sure there are tons of people online probably watching who can empathize, but um uh, in my personal life yeah. could relate. I had friends who didn't grow up very religious. I had friends who did grow up religious, but they had no problem with this, no problem with sex or intimacy. And so they'd be out doing their thing. And I would be like back in my dorm room, like sobbing, like, why can't I get over this? Why? And I would try to talk to them about that and be like, just, just get over it. Like, there's no, there's nothing wrong with it. Like, I'm like, I know there's nothing wrong with it, but I still hate myself. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's, um, it's so hard to articulate to people who didn't really internalize yeah. like that shame. In fact, there are so many parts of your book that just made my, well, skin crawl isn't exactly the right way to put it, but it was difficult for me to read. So, um, like you have a whole chapter in your book just called shame. Yep. <laughs> and when I so every day I would give myself like an assignment. I had to read like a certain number of pages. By the oh, way, I was like always go over because I was like, wait, what's happening next? Um, but when I flipped the page and it's a chapter called shame, I was like, ooh, Susanna, buckle up. 
<laughs> yeah. um, but so basically like uh, well guys you should go read it for yourself but you're on a mission trip in india and mm-hmm. you have a crush on this boy in your mission group and you have so much shame and guilt around having a crush for this boy because you had deeply internalized the message that your future husband was watching your every move. You lived your life as if the person you would eventually marry was literally watching you 24 seven and you had to like not hurt his feelings or make him ashamed. Talk about collective guilt, like at all. And you're like 15. Yeah. And I mean, especially like when it really started to hit me was like what happens at the end of the chapter. But just talk a little bit about what it's like to view yourself through that lens. Because I think I did too so long of like, how do I look Mm -hmm. less specifically towards a future spouse, but definitely like a hypervigilance of some kind. Yes. No, hyper hypervigilance, I think is the perfect term for it. Um, so I, yeah, e- echoing a little bit of what you said and kind of what I said earlier, I was very heavily steeped in the evangelical expression, the evangelical Christian expression of purity culture, which for me meant dressing modestly for sure. And modest in the youth groups that I was a part of meant like maybe a tank top was okay, but it better have big fat straps. Right. And, oh, so, come on. Yeah. Like no big straps. straps. What? Yeah. <laughs> no, no short shorts. Like, you know, if you're, you know, if it, if it's shorter than where your hands fall on your legs, like that around that, like lower thigh area, it's, you know, going to get talked about if not called mm-hmm. out. Um, I went to some youth groups where a girl, you know, would show up, uh, this one girl showed up in a halter top and they handed her a giant ass t-shirt to put on over herself. So she wouldn't be a distraction. Um, that that's the type of modesty culture and Christianity that I'm talking about. And I know, you know, Muslim women have it way harder in many ways, but this was, this was my experience. And, uh, it's also very relative as well. Sorry to interrupt. Like, cause I grew up in relatively a much more conservative Republican family than everyone else in my liberal Seattle community. Mm. Right. So yeah. and yeah. I, I sensed that compare that that relative comparison as well. So I knew that there was a difference and that I was on the stricter side of it. So even if yeah. you know people have a way more extreme like relatively, like yeah. you're in it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um no I so I I was very like Exposed to it from a young age. When I was 11, my dad gave me a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. 11, almost 12. I was right around there. And that book um, was basically the the accompaniment to the Bible. If you were a good Christian single, you had the Bible and you had I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I grew that That's what I thought it meant to be a true Christian. And basically the message of that book and other books afterward was God wants us to be completely pure to this future spouse that he hopefully has set aside for you and you need to live your life in faith that he does have someone set aside for you because it's God's will for men and women to marry and produce offspring. Um, sometimes there's the, the the single big calling to be single, but we didn't focus so much on that. Um, it was much more for women. It was don't be a stumbling block. Don't be a distraction. Mm-hmm. Your brothers in Christ. And what that means is like dress modestly. Don't flirt. Don't hold hands. Like don't date. Um, you were supposed to court when you were ready to marry, you could have like chaperoned courtship visits. Um, that would be chaperoned by like your parents or your pastors or like friends in group settings. That's how you would theoretically get to know a future spouse once you were of an age to marry. Um, so when I was 15 in India on that mission trip, never held hands with a guy, never kissed a boy, never went on a date, never went to a school dance. I was homeschooled my entire life. Um, and so I was just very, the only boys I knew were through youth group. And there was like some, some kids in youth group dated, but I, some didn't. And I, I certainly didn't. And it felt like so much responsibility Mm -hmm. to essentially the gatekeeper of not just my own good standing with God, but men's good standing with God too. Exactly. It felt like the, the burden of not just my own sin, but the sin of straight men or just men who were, might be attracted to me, I was responsible for their sin too. 
because maybe I laughed too hard at their joke. Maybe I put my hand on their shoulder. Maybe I wore, maybe like I bent over when I was picking a kid up at the children's nursery at church and my skirt rode up, you know, and he thought I was flirting with him. Like these were the constant hypervigilance that I lived in. Like, oh, did I laugh too, too much? Like, did I, did I give a full frontal hug? Like, did I make sure my boobs didn't touch his chest? Like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was just a constant state of self monitoring and self policing and also other monitoring and policing, like, like in accountability groups, um, you know, like con confessing things and holding each other accountable. And that's one of the things that happened to me in India was I was held accountable for flirting with it's okay this, <laughs> this scene in the book had me fucked up on so many levels alice <laughs> on so many levels like okay so for the audience basically so she has like this crush on this guy and they you know like explore part of a rocks together or cave together with like the rest of the group not present and then everyone's like gossiping and there's this other kid who has a crush on Alice and broaches her friend to be like, hey, like, does she like me? Does she like this other guy? Like, what's up? And it turns into this situation of you being confronted for you having a crush on this other kid. And then it basically becomes like a let's collectively shame Alice like campaign and even like the the leaders in the youth group like participate in this so yeah. like you so you reject this guy and then he forces your friend to admit that you like this other guy and then he proceeds to throw it back in your face and then get the other kids to come and say, yeah, you are flirty. Yeah, you do do this. Yeah, you, it's so obvious. Oh my gosh, you're, you're such a flirt. Meanwhile, you're like so virginal, you don't even use a tampon. <laughs> like literally guys, like, <laughs> like, um, have, like you, you internally beat the shit out of yourself for even you try so hard not to have a crush on this boy. You're 15 for God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so after they are like collectively shaming you, then they're like, okay, you need to go talk to the youth pastors about this. No, 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 actually, no, you have, you're like all withdrawn and they ask you what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you over into the next day. This was like a two day ordeal. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they, yeah. Yeah. They were like, where's Alice? How come she hasn't come down to eat? Uh, so yeah, because I can't show my room. face because I've been told that I'm leaving, leading all my brothers in Christ astray because I'm literally so sheltered and homeschooled that I don't even know what flirting is in other people's context, right? That so I'm a slut and I don't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go to the youth leaders and they're like. And then you say that you don't remember exactly how it evolved, but then basically you're made to go door to door to every single male peer on that youth group and uh, confess and apologize to them. Yeah. Like everything that that is saying to you as a child is so crazy. Like if that had been me that gone through it, like I wouldn't be able to write this book today. <laughs> like. <laughs> Oh it's my been god. Like some years. Um yeah. And no. I think so people don't always understand like how much goes into these experiences that you're not even able to articulate like until years later. You're like why does this cut me to the core? Yeah. Like probably because it's been held up in front of other people like this. Yeah. You know? And reading that, I got so heated because I wanted oh, to, like, don't you fuck with Alice. Like, oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. thank you. No, I have to say it was really cathartic just now hearing your recap of that story because it's oh. like, even though I wrote it and I know it, it happened to me. It's like hearing someone else say, I'm like, yeah, it's fucked up, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, guys. See, she knows it's fucked up. The outrage. You're like, yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, yes. No, there's still that little 15 year old in me that that like, oh man, just was beating herself up and that really thought that I was the problem. Um, mm -hmm. Because of course I was the problem. It was never that men might have been interested in me or attracted to me. It was I must have done something to to like invite that invite that attention or I didn't do enough to block it uh, through how I dressed or what I said or what my mannerisms were. And like, you know, an example of mannerisms, one of the things that that group of people brought to my attention during our, our night of shame, <laughs> my, my, my very own shaming circle was uh, I, I would, I like, one of the things that I remember someone saying was that I was stretching in the lobby. Like we were all staying at a hotel and we'd meet in the lobby before we go do our mission trip adventures or whatever. And like, I was a competitive figure skater and dancer. Like, like I've always been very active and to me, stretching is just like second nature. I'm bored. Oh, stretch. And oh my gosh, of course, in retrospect, I was like, oh, I can't believe I had, the, I stretched in front of everybody. My legs were open. I was like, no. oh. <laughs> yeah, in my baggy ass cargo pants that I had to wear in my modest oversized blouse. Like it, it was, it, it like, it, it's so everything like that. And of course that, that night, that experience only made my own self vigilance all the more extra mm -hmm. because it was like, wow, I thought I was such a good Christian. I really thought, felt like God was giving me some humble pie because I thought I was such a good Christian girl. Like I, I was sexually pure and to the uh, certainly embody into the best of my intentions in my heart and mind like i would always repent for if my daydreams got carried away with a crush you know i'd be like i'm so sorry god like help me to be faithful to my future husband and in the meantime look to you for companionship and you know trust that you will you'll reward my fidelity later with this incredible romance and so um you know i felt like i'd already been doing so many things right and after that experience in india it was just like it felt like God was telling me like pride cometh before a fall, you know, like you thought you were such a good Christian girl and you need to be aware of things you didn't even know you needed to be aware of things that you, it's, it was like, I, I had to learn to see myself from outside myself. And yeah, because I didn't know what, what flirting looked like to other people, because like I was so sheltered, I rarely saw it. You know, I, I went church was as social as I ever got. I never had friends outside of church until I moved out of my home. And, and so it was very like, there was a brief two month stint in Girl Scouts, but I barely count that. Like it was so short lived. Um, so it was like, I, I didn't know what flirting looked like. I didn't know um, how other girls, secular girls might behave so that I would know how not to behave. Mm -hmm. I only knew that I was supposed to do this and I'd done all that. And still I was somehow such a flirt and a tease and a distraction. Um, that was the hard, the hardest part of that whole experience in some ways was definitely knocking on the doors of the guys and owning up to it and being like, I'm sorry, you know, it's been brought to my attention that I was a distraction. And, I and some of them are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Some of them are like, oh, I, I don't know. You know, like I didn't notice anything, but thanks, you know, like you're forgiven. But other guys were like, oh yeah, I kind of noticed it, including the guy I had a crush on, which just made it all the more like, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> like, fuck, he noticed that I was like, trying not to crush on him. So I was mortified. That was one of the hardest parts because it affirmed that mm -hmm. I would definitely been in the wrong. If I was being forgiven, that meant I truly had something to be sorry for. Mm -hmm. And up until that point, I could kind of, there was some part of my heart that was like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe it's not so bad. But as soon as I apologized and received forgiveness, it was just confirmation that, yeah, I'd been that bad. And it, yeah, it fucked me up. You know, it, it fucked me up and my way of handling it later um, to a certain degree was like rebellion, like I mentioned, but also I don't mean to paint too rosy of a picture because that rebellion occurred over a number of years. And while eventually I do, in retrospect, I can credit it with helping me break some of those um, holds of shame. It it was not always easy. Like, like uh, I remember... I'd been having, I started having sex when I was still a Christian, but one year later, and like, it didn't, it was fine. 
like I almost felt troubled and unnerved by how fine I felt because I thought for sure I was going to feel guilty for sure. I'm going to feel shame and dirty and like regretful because I gave away my virginity. I'm never going to get it back. Um, I really expected to feel that way. And I was so creeped out almost that I didn't, I was like, Oh my God, my, the, the birds are still singing. I still have this audition to study. I feel totally fine. I'm hungry. I, <laughs> I don't know. Like I, it was just like, weird how okay I felt. A year later, I lost my faith completely. And then I experienced really bad anxiety attacks after sex. And it's interesting to me, like why it was like a delayed reaction sort of. And, I, and it makes sense to me because what I think happened was um, when I started having sex and I was still a Christian, I was really trying to remake God into a God that was like sex positive and, and like LGBTQ affirming and didn't care if I had consensual sex. And because I still believed in God and I still believed that Jesus died for my sins, I was still saved. I was still a Christian. I wasn't really like, he wants me to be happy. Yeah. He wants me to be happy. Like let's try on this God is love idea instead of God wants us to fear him. And the, the duality of those coexisting that always fucked with me. I can't, they can't both be true to me. They never could. So it was either the God of fear or the God of love. Um, because the God of fear, like, was the one I believed in the most because hell, you know, like, and by the time I tried focusing on the God of love, I was beginning to have serious doubts about hell. I was like, maybe it doesn't exist, you know, like, maybe, well, uh -huh. how does this work? Is this one of those, like, allegorical parts of the Bible? Like, I don't know. I'm not sure, you know, because we're, we're not supposed to take it all literally. And we can't because it contradicts itself so mm -hmm. much. So we, we can't take it literally, but yet we'll go to hell if we don't take at least part of it literally. And which parts, you know, oh, let the Holy Spirit tell you, well, fuck, what if the Holy Spirit doesn't tell me anything? You know, like, how am I supposed to know? Like, that was my experience within, within the God of fear. Um, and the God of love, like, I really thought, like, wanted people to be happy. And as long as I wasn't hurting anyone, um, as long as I was still being truthful and not lying to anybody, um, you know, or coercing anybody or being coerced, like I felt like God would approve, you know? And, and so I think that's why when I couldn't believe in God anymore, like at all, mm. all of those fears of hell came back and sex triggered it for me. It was like one of the very tangible triggers I had, um, that would put me right back into a place of like, I am a fornicator and I'm doomed to etern eternal damnation now. Like I, like, cause for for me, and I think for many for many people who grew up in Christianity and especially certain expressions of Christianity, sex was like the worst sin you could do. Oh my god! Sex, it was what? like. Do people even like, argue this? Like, <laughs> yeah. well, like I, it, it was so like um, we never talked about bigger sins like burglary well, or technically murder. It's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Technically, yeah, but let's like, be real. Exactly. It sucks, you guys. This isn't an argument. <laughs> and like, even Jesus said that blasphemy is like the worst of all the sins. It's like the only one he said he wouldn't forgive. But all of the churches I went to, we're going to focus on sex, a very natural instinct that humans have. And yeah, yeah. I'm just going to like vilify it. And, and specifically in the churches that I went to, and this is, there's a lot of variants, but the ones I went to, it was heterosexual premarital sex. It was almost, I felt like it would have been easier for me to be gay than it was to be mm. um, having heterosexual sex outside. Well, I have a quick question though. Is it because being gay or lesbian or queer just didn't exist? Because like that was the environment I grew up in. Like it was so focused on heterosexuality because like, it's like, it's as if those things, those other orientations didn't even exist. You know, so of course they wouldn't talk about that being a sin because that it it's like not even a factor. <laughs> <laughs> totally, I know what you mean. Or, or so taboo that you don't even yeah. talk about it. Yeah, as so, existing. So I think you know, like because I grew up moving around, I belonged to many different churches. Mm -hmm. um, some of them did have like conversion therapy programs. So yes, there were. Uh, there were definitely. I was definitely. There were definitely like non-hetero people in my existence, but they were treated as broken. Um, they're, they're broken and they need to be fixed. And as long as they're coming to God and repenting of their brokenness and doing everything they can to like be straight, uh, then, then it's okay. Like they were looked at as broken. Whereas for a heterosexual to have premarital sex was like, 
you're not just broken, you're a fucking sinner. Like you did it on purpose. Like I think there was a weird that, that that's um, the yeah, I see the distinction. Like, like I I could like and maybe it's different for everyone, but my the impression that I retain is that being being gay or bi or queer in the churches that I went to, it was like obviously a sin, but it was almost like a sin that you kind of couldn't help maybe there was some degree of understanding that you can't just pick who you're attracted to some some amount of mercy and grace and empathy for that but boy you better not act on it though yeah. that's where your brokenness will become a sin is if you act on your brokenness whereas if you're straight and you just want to have sex and you're not married you're just a straight up sinner you're not broken yeah. Exactly. Like it's something you actively choose to do. Yeah, exactly. And and so that's why I think to me, and you know, I, again, everyone has different experiences in these places, but for me, it just felt like the most cardinal sin, um, greater than lying, greater than any, than anything was having sex. And I think that's why sex, once I did lose my faith, did become a trigger of just anxiety. And like, I, I could only calm down by reading my Bible, um, which I didn't even believe in anymore. But I read it because I needed, I, I really wanted to double check what Jesus had to say about heterosexual premarital sex, which was like next to nothing. And mm -hmm. I know I was supposed to believe the whole Bible was the inspired word of God. But at that time I was like, okay, but Jesus is the only way to heaven. So he's the only way for me to not go to hell. So let's just focus on what Jesus has to say about sex. And it was like very little, you know, there were, there's a few words like fornication, adultery. I would look up what these words meant and they all led back to each other. And it wasn't explicit. It wasn't, it was things like everything from incest. Well, I'm, I'm not fucking my brothers here. Like to, <laughs> it was everything from like incest to, um, like harlotry, like prostitution. I'm like, well, I'm not doing that either. I'm just wanting consensual adult heterosexual sex. <laughs> you know, like that's, I'm pretty basic and vanilla that way. Um, Outside of the <laughs> purity of holy matrimony. Thank you exactly, very much. Exactly. Like, I don't want to put a ring on it yet. I don't want to sign a lifelong contract. I just want to get laid. Um, and, and so it just like, Jesus didn't really talk about it. And I figured what I told myself was, if it was really such a big deal to Jesus, that I didn't have premarital heterosexual sex, I feel like he would have made it pretty clear. Like there's other things in the Bible that are very clear, like butchering instructions for altar sacrifices are crystal fucking clear. Like there's so many clear instructions for like how women are not supposed to dress, you know, and like how men are supposed to do a certain tradition. And I just figured like, if it was really that big of a deal, God, in some book of the Bible would have been so explicit about consensual, premarital, heterosexual, vaginal intercourse. Cause that's what I want. <laughs> no, let's be very specific. <laughs> Cause I was like, if we're going to be so specific about all these other things, like let's be specific here. And it just wasn't there. And, and I was like, huh, it, it eased that, that anxiety, it eased that shame trigger for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and allowed me to like calm down and, and sleep at night. Um, but it still took like, there there were still so many things that, that I experienced shame from. I remember one time um, I gave a guy a, a hug and uh, he, it was like in a professional setting. And, uh, he, he was like, Oh, just so you know, like, it's fine that you give me a hug, but I don't, uh, I don't normally give hugs and I, I normally don't engage in physical contact when I'm at a professional setting. He was, he told me this so kindly with such respect. And I burst into tears. Cause I was just like, Oh my uh, God. Like I burst into, and he I, was did like, it oh, I, I did it again. I did it again. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I thought this was a safe, like just friendly. It was such an innocent, like, oh, thank you so much, goodbye type of hug. And hearing him say that, and of course the logical part of me understands like, oh, of course, you know, that makes total sense to have that sort of policy in a workplace, like, I get it. I I, just, I was just like 15 year old Alice in that minute, just being like, oh, I fucked up, oh no. You know, I'm like, I remember the next time I saw him talking with him about it and, and um, he was so compassionate and felt so horrible. He was like, oh, and I, I, I felt horrible too, but him feel bad. I was like, I was like, no, no, because no, there wasn't time. I forget what the situation was, but there wasn't time for us to talk about my sudden burst into tears. It was just like, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. Like, we'll talk about it later. And um, we talked about it later and then it made sense to him. He was like, oh gosh, you know, like, I'm so sorry. And I was like, it's okay. Like, thank you for handling it the way you did. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, like, I'm sorry I made you feel bad and that I couldn't articulate what I was going through, but he totally got it, you know? So like, even though I, I talk about my recovery and, and, um, finding my own little ways of loosening shame's hold, I don't know if it ever fully leaves us. Um, I never saw that reaction coming. You know, I thought I'd done a lot of work to move past that. Oh, <laughs> oh. you know, this is something. So I literally had to have a pep talk with Armin before this because, oh. like, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> and he was like, Susanna, like, you don't have to be, like, you don't have to have slain the dragon. Like, I don't have to be over this yet. No, you don't. And you're like, you're just going to talk about it. You're just going to describe the dragon. You don't have to pretend like this is something you've totally solved. Like you yeah. found the key, you fixed it. No, no, no. Okay. Oh. I'm like, okay. <laughs> oh. Like, oh, girl, that's so yeah. horrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really hard. Like a lot of people yeah. don't understand, including like my, um, like my sibling. Um, and I think maybe it has to do with um, he's like so a little bit younger than me. Our experiences of our family. I'm the oldest child. You're also the oldest child. I think we get it the hardest because and both my parents are converts as well. Well, they were always raised in kind of a Christian environment, but to Catholicism. Um, so it's like that very similar to you. It was an active decision for them. Yeah. And I think when it's an active decision, especially as a convert, there's usually like increased conviction in comparison to the people I know who are just kind of like culturally Catholic or culturally Christian. Yeah. Um, and so especially when you're the firstborn, let alone a daughter, it's like we have to get this right. Yeah. Like and also it's just the first child in general. It's like your parents trying to, you know, create this like little principled thing. <laughs> you know, and I mean, I get it. I'd probably do the same thing if I was a parent, but, um, and like, I was trying to explain to my brother when we were on a long road trip, um, just the two of us, cause he doesn't understand some of my activism. Like, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes he thinks I'm very angry or whatever. It's mm -hmm. like, you don't understand how this is like, there's nothing in my life that I struggle with more than my relationship to sex in that I can contribute that completely to the influence of religion in my life, like yeah. unequivocally, like, yeah. so it's hard for people to understand like how much there, there's nothing in my life that religion has touched more than my relationship to sex yeah. to the point that I didn't want to be a woman. I went for several years basically saying like that I was trans or I, I, I didn't even want to identify within this gender because it was so shameful to me. Like people don't understand <laughs> like how oh, deep God. it goes that you were, you, I like, I dress completely differently than I do now. I had absorbed modesty culture in a very different way. Yeah, because I've gone to uniformed Catholic school almost the entirety of my education, um, and so it was less about me being modest and more about me wanting to hide the fact that I was a woman. Like yeah. I would wear very baggy clothing. Like I looked like a stoner skater boy. Like I I dressed very masculinely. Like because yeah. I was just in kind of in the way that um some people with eating disorders dress where they're literally trying to hide the entire shape of their body because i was like i denied myself on so many different levels i denied my womanness yeah. like let alone my own sexual pleasure i didn't even what <laughs> like yeah. and um i think it took me, it, it's still something I'm working through is getting out of that denial. Like, especially mm -hmm. as a Christian, there are so many different things that you are taught to deny yourself. And there are certain very specific Catholic flavors to it. Like it's very saintly, it's very martyrly, like it to be, just be giving and denying and 
you know, as uh, I don't, it didn't, based on the book, it didn't seem like saints were a very big part of your practice, but you know, you're as a Catholic, you're giving these saints as role models and it's all about the depths of sacrifice that they are willing to go to for their yeah. faith. And that showed up for you in different ways as well. Um, but not based on saints <laughs> and, um, it's so hard to allow yourself to have pleasure without guilt. And that's one thing that I really liked that you started to talk about towards the end of your book was your recovery towards like allowing yourself pleasure. Yeah. And um, yeah. So what was that like for you? Scary. <laughs> yeah. Right. Scary. <laughs> it was, it really was. And pleasure, not just sexually, but the mm -hmm. pleasure of being lazy. The, I talk about the seven deadly sins and how they became my seven saving graces. Um, you know, the, the, the pleasure of gluttony, the pleasure of saying no when I felt too tired to agree to, get, to take on yet another volunteer non-pay project, the pleasure of um, smoking weed and just getting high, you know, just because I wanted to, not for research purposes or anything else that my mind would try to justify, like, you know, that sort of thing, but just because I wanted to, because it made me feel good. Um, and then certainly pleasure with sex. Um, it, it was like, even when it felt okay to me, it took a long time for me to uh, truly experience pleasurable sex to where I could like voice what I wanted and what I didn't want, what I liked and what I didn't like. And honestly, it's still hard sometimes. Like there's still like, this this part of me, um, you're so vulnerable. I'm gonna meet you there. Like Aww. there's still there's still this part of me that has a hard time saying what I want, um, or saying when like, oh, that's not really doing it for me. But oh, he's really trying. Oh, like I should, you know. Like, there's then and, you know I know I know a lot of women even outside of religion um, have can have a hard time. Women in general, I feel like often have a hard time state stating what they want and what they don't like because. Um, we're conditioned from being little girls in most cultures to be agreeable, to be sweet, to submit, even in secular communities. And um, that's changing. But, you know, like I grew up in, in the 90s mainly, and it was like still very much of the fabric of American culture that I found myself in. And um, it's still hard for me to sometimes like be, be like, oh, I'm not really liking that. Oh, I feel bad. Like, oh my gosh, you know, or like, oh, I, I really want this. You know, like, is that okay? Oh my God. Like, asking for something? Yeah, like, ask for something. <laughs> you know, it like makes my face feel hot right now to even think about. You know, like it's so. I don't mean to give anyone or yourself the impression that like I'm. Uh, I haven't slayed the dragon either. You know, I feel like the dragon's a lot more at bay, um, but still comes comes back sometimes in ways that like I don't expect uh like like when i you know burst into tears when i gave a guy a hug or the other like like what i just said like it like sometimes in certain sexual experiences all of a sudden like i think i'm liberated now but why is it so hard for me to say if i'd like something else you know like i'm enjoying this but what if i wanted more what if i wanted it more this way what if i didn't like this you know like it's very that's still hard. Um, and it's still, I never know when, when I'll have a, a moment like that. Like the, the shame triggers, like most triggers. They're shocking. Yeah. Oh can, my God. And they can come out of nowhere and yeah. it can feel so defeating. Yeah. Cause they're like, I thought I already did this. Yeah. And it, it feels like you're back at square one, but really you're not. Yeah. Like sometimes just even other people talking about what they like freely and openly without guilt, just like they're just talking about it. It I've had breakdowns. Yeah. Like of other people being sexually open and sex positive. Yeah. Like recently, guys. Like <laughs> and yeah. you know, and it it yeah. and then and then you're I was just rocked by it. And you're like, what is going on? Cause I think moments like that, um, especially when it's other other people just doing their own thing. It's nothing to do in relation yeah. to me. Like when I see that reflected back to me, 
it hits me the extent to which something was taken from me. Mm, yes. You know, like, and yes. yeah, like, I think for so long, I just felt broken and like, there was just something wrong with me, like so deeply wrong with me. And then other people have helped reinforce for me, like, no, this was done to you. Yeah. You know, like you have to, you didn't choose this. You have to forgive yourself a little bit for struggling. Yeah. Cause this was, this was done to you. Like, and that's why I really like Dr. Daryl Ray at um, recovering from religion and his yeah. work is so amazing. And um, I had a chance to talk to him when, uh, guys, check it out on Secular Jihadists. I was a co-host for that episode. And um, we talked about sex shame and different religions, and including in Hinduism. That was interesting a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I can't remember exactly how he said it. And of course, you know, our minds are like this, but it, my, I just latched onto this one phrase he said, and I'm going to say it wrong. So if someone listens back to it and it's completely different, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is my recollection <laughs> um, because it reflected something my therapist has said to me, which was basically like, you know, around your early adolescence, like this is just something that was stunted in you. Like, cause you're just kind of taught to just close off that part of yourself. Like as you're entering into your adolescence, just like shut it down. Like it's shameful. And so you just reinforce. So it's just like locked further and further, further back behind these walls. Like, and so you're, I mean, it sounds harsh, but I mean, for me, it, it rings true. It's just like, you're, you're stunted in this way. Like there's a part of me that's still like eight years old or like, yeah, 14 years old that needs to actually allow myself this development that was denied me because of the way I internalize dogma. Yeah. And um, so I was like, well, shoot. Okay. I'm uh, starting at like 14 years old. Let's go. I'm, I'm 25. Let's do this. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Oh man. So are you familiar with um, the book Pure by Linda K. Klein? No. Oh my God. I'm going to write this down. Okay, girl, I'm going to give you a list of things that, that, I, that have helped me and for anyone else listening too. like, I, so I wrote a blog about it on my website. There's um, it's, it's called is purity culture, a form of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. and in that <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Um, and uh, in that blog post, I cite Linda K. Klein's work as well as some the, the work of Dr. Tina Shermer Sellers. She she's a doctor who, who works specifically in with sexual shame, mm. which she undeniably sees religion as one of the greatest contributors to it. So um, both between those women's work, I found uh, so many. I've learned of so many symptoms of sexual, specifically religious sexual shame that have shown up that I didn't know about. And so um, th this might sound familiar to some listeners, but I'm just going to share some of it here because it just seems too important for anyone who can relate to any of this to, to not know about. Um, basically, uh, Dr. Shermer Sellers noticed in her therapy practice that she was seeing like around the early 2000s, she was seeing a lot of young people, college age people come in talking like showing symptoms of sexual abuse, breaking out mm -hmm. the hives when they would like make out with somebody, having a panic attack if they like had sex, you know, having suicidal thoughts and feelings of worthlessness and depression if they were, you know, if they if they had any sort of sexual activity at, or even like what you just said, talking about it or being around other people who are talking about it. And she was like, what's going on? Because what a lot of these people had in common was they had never been sexually abused. They'd grown up in purity culture. And this inspired her, her to learn about the big purity culture movement that kind of began and really gained traction at um, New Heights throughout the 90s. Mm -hmm. And with the whole like um, abstinence only teachings, you know, that were prevalent even in public schools uh, and still. not in schools. Still, yeah, still in American public schools, this is very common. Like, just don't do it, guys. Just say no. <laughs> and, and it's like saying no to your humanity. And, and oh, yes. it's, 
it's saying no to being to being a person and and it is having something taken from us it is a form of sexual abuse because um what they have in common and i write about i wrote about this like to me what i take away is what what they have in common is um your body is not your own your body belongs to someone else when you're being sexually abused by someone you don't have agency over your body you're mm -hmm. abused when you're taught that your body belongs to a future spouse or and or to god in the meantime it is not yours to pleasure it is not yours to show it is not yours to feel good in it is a danger you cover that shit up and you repent and you don't feel anything you lock down any naughty desires that come up your body is not your own so that's one thing that they have in common. They violate your sense of self and what you want and what feels good to you and what does not feel good to you. You cannot say no in both of these scenarios. You can't say no to God because hell. And you can't say no to when you're being abused because you're fucking being abused. Um, yeah. If it were that easy, you wouldn't be in that situation. So it's really hard to say no in both of these. And the consequences, also the consequences in each of these scenarios, the stakes are really hi if you're scared and you're in a place where you're being sexually assaulted the consequences are high for fighting back it might end in death if you're in a place where you're uh, uh, believing that you're going to go to hell if you engage in any sort of sexual activity those are high consequences to me hell was extremely real it was like what's a little bit of denial of the flesh in this life to avoid an eternity of torture in the afterlife these these are huge fucked up things, you know. Yeah. Like there, there's um, I know a lot of people might have a bone to pick, like oh, you know, sexual assault is nothing like purity culture. You know, purity culture keeps people safe from putting themselves in positions where they would be sexually assaulted. First of all, cow. Uh, like, that's not okay. how that works. <laughs> um, so it's very, it's you know, I, I understand that there's a lot of people that d don't quite um get the, some of these correlations but the symptoms are often the same vaginismus is an example for anyone who doesn't know vaginismus is when like a woman's vagina or a girl's vagina like just blocks up when when there's um when she's trying to have penetrative vaginal sex and uh oftentimes the dick can't even get in you know it's extremely, or it's painful. So extremely painful and um you know i've heard of women who've had to have surgery to have sex with their husband um, because they waited until marriage and, you know, like you spend so many years locking that shit down that your body just be doesn't know you've signed a, a marriage certificate and said some vows and it's okay now. Yeah, you right. Your body to have it not be okay under all of these very harsh penalties. Um, and so it it's, that's a very tangible example. And a lot, another, another, um, trigger for vaginismus can be an assault, you know, your body locks, locks down, you know? And so when the symptoms are very similar, if not the same, that is all I need to know that purity culture is a form of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. It might not be an invasive form of sexual abuse, but that's irrelevant. You have the, yeah, it's ir it's irrelevant to me. Um, I think what you touched on with how it, it 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 completely strips your agency on autonomy is so important to touch on. And you're right, people. No one can deny that the consequences are dire to the point that you, for example, didn't think you had the agency to say no to being engaged at the age of seventeen. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> like, guys, I mean, the way that she lays that out in the book, like. At the entire way that you were raised, this guy just presented himself to you. Ironically, the same person who um, per basically started the shame circle against you, okay, a few years earlier. Yeah. Um, One and the same. Ooh, I was like, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're not done with this character. Yeah, I was like, oh, 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 there's a twist. Yeah. Um, basically, he just presents himself to Alice one day and is like, um, God told me that you're going to be my wife and you're in you internally, like just go cold, but panic at the same time. Like, cause yeah. it's everything that you had been taught was supposed yeah. to be the identifiers for this man you had been performing for essentially since you entered adolescence. 
right? Mm -hmm. That they would come mm -hmm. and it would be because God told them so. And then the elders in your life, like, you know, your parents, his parents mm -hmm. would confirm that God had also told them, taught, spoke to them and said so. Yeah. And yeah. all of those things happened. And you're like, I don't even like, I I'm, I'm utterly terrified on the inside of this, but all of these markers are here. And because of everything I've been taught, I don't, I don't have any option to say no. Yeah. Because if I say no, I'm going against God's will and I'm going to hell. Yep. Guys, like that's how high the stakes are. Yep. For a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people think that arranged marriages happen in other cultures. They don't happen in American Christianity. Uh, it, I was facing what felt to me like an arranged marriage. I was never proposed to. I was told. And then parents confirmed that this was God's will. And I was never asked. I was never like, this guy and I weren't even dating. We were friends. We, I, I didn't date. I was still waiting for this other future husband that I thought I was going to have because it was going to be this incredible romance that I'd waited for. And it was not, I did not love this man that way. And I didn't feel like I could say no. Like it didn't, it didn't cross my mind. And it started once again with him being jealous of another guy. <laughs> You're so right. I love hearing these patterns you see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can yeah. you tell I wanted to be a psychologist? Um, <laughs> yeah, so, because the first time it was like, oh, she mm -hmm. likes this other guy. Okay, I'm going to like, test some waters and then flip it on her and then this time it's like oh you're hanging out with these guys around la because you're like yeah i get along with guys better and he's like why does that bother you it's like because god told me that i'm gonna marry you mm -hmm. you're like my life is over now that's basically what happened yeah <laughs> that's yeah. that's the nutshell and i it did feel like my life was over and yeah i was 17 i was 17 and felt like i because I was never asked, like no wasn't even an option. And even if I had been asked, if it was accompanied by like God showed me and then confirmed by like parents, it would be, it would have been like I, I would have said yes. Like, no was not a realistic option because if you say no, it's like okay, God gave us free will. You can always say no. Okay, and then use my free will to go to hell. That's yeah, like, it's completely coercive. Like that's the love of God. He loved us so much that he gave us free will to choose to go to hell and be damned for all eternity. That's how much he loves us. That's yeah. not much of a free will, in my opinion. Um, that's coercion, <laughs> to use another term. Like, if someone is telling you, you need to do this or else you're going to die, that's like, that. that's so wrong. That's so coercive. And that's, that's to me, what the God of the Bible represents. He's a very coercive, fear-driven God because... He wouldn't, there would be no mention of hell if God wasn't coercive. Um, I understand. Yeah. You know, and I and think <laughs> like someone who maybe wasn't raised this way, like wouldn't understand, like, why, why didn't you say, no, this doesn't make any sense. Like there's so many things about this that are wrong, but what you did was a completely logical conclusion of everything you believed about this life or supposedly the next life. Like, <laughs> That's what I don't feel like is highlighted enough is like, this was completely logical at mm -hmm. the same time, utterly terrifying, mm -hmm. probably because it was so logical. You're like, yeah, because it felt so permanent. It was so sensical and so natural and just like textbook how it was supposed to go, except for the part that I wasn't happy. Um, yeah. Yeah, which, yeah, it, it, it was, I appreciate you <laughs> saying that it was so logical because I feel like so many people are like, like, why did you go along with it? Oh my God, if the guy said that to me, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, man, I, if you had my upbringing, you probably would have gone along with it too, you know, or if you would have my personality type. Because I, I have talked to other girls who grew up very similar to me who also had a guy say that, you know, God showed them they were supposed to get married. And you're like, no. I just wasn't wired with that sort of makeup to like, be like, no, like, I, please, you know, you're using God to get me, you know, like I wasn't, I wasn't gifted with prophetic insight that way. <laughs> so like, I just, I just, you know, I, I was so used to not hearing from God and having my life be ruled by all the things that he told everyone else but me that I just, yeah, I just went along with it. And, um, saying no, like I said earlier, is still hard for me. 
to say no to something like like once I did enter the real world, you know, I moved by myself to LA and I I you know like started interacting with heathens, um, people who were not Christians, and I, <laughs> I started getting asked out, and I had hardly ever been asked out, and it was so frustrating, and I felt like so scared of saying no. It would give me. I was in therapy for this too. I talked. My my therapist um, also helped me learn how to date in some ways, like what you were saying earlier. Um, my therapist helped me uh, because I told him like, I have such bad anxiety. I find myself going on dates with guys that I don't want to go out with. And because I feel like I can't say no, I'm scared of hurting their feelings and I'm scared of their anger because Mm -hmm. these times I had spoken up to be like, oh no, I'm not really interested in dating. Who said anything about dating? Get over yourself. You're so presumptuous. I just wanted to have coffee. And it was just like, like a gaslighting, like, like what's going, I no, I'm pretty sure you were in, uh, you know, I would just you also have no external framework for what it's supposed to be like. So in psychology, we talk about something called social scripts. For example, when you go into a restaurant, you know what the social script is of how you interact with a waiter at a restaurant. There's a script for that. There's a sh- social script for a heterosexual relationship. Oh my you God, know? Susanna, this is and, like such a key for me right now. And yeah, <laughs> yeah so your social script was completely within a very specific like doctrinal framework, right? You realize that that's not true. There's no evidence for that. And it furthermore has no utility to you. Yeah. So you, you throw that away, but there's nothing you've been taught no other script to replace that with. And when you were saying, just hit me <laughs> with me, my thing with dating was I, took me so long to learn I was just like a serial monogamist and my therapist was like you know that you can date like more than one person at a time I was like what and she's (laughs) like yeah that's a thing that you can do and um I I came to the realization that I was entering into every single relationship as if this was going to be the last relationship of my life because I had been taught my whole life that you have relationships to get married. So entering into a relationship, I put way too much pressure on anything because I was like, if I'm dating this person, even at all, that means that I have to be prepared to spend the rest of my life with them, which is like not a very productive way to like be in a relationship with people, especially like in your early twenties. <laughs> like, yeah. like, oh my! What's yeah. and it also, um, <laughs> yeah. As soon as there was like friction in a relationship, like I, it would just fall apart because I'm like, this is supposed to be for the rest of my life. Like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. And they're like, what? Like. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. If I could have a yellow highlighter for everything you just said right now, (laughs) because I, I relate to that so much. And even years after leaving my faith, like, and to a, to a degree, even now, there's still part of my mentality of like, why would I be in a relationship unless it had the chance for marriage? Like, what's the point? It's either a relationship's going to end one of two ways. We're either to get married or we're going to break up and it's going to suck if we break up. So isn't the hope of every relationship to like end up in marriage? Like there's this very, to me, that felt logical, you know, like even outside of religion, it felt logical still to be like, why would I waste my time being in a relationship with someone that, uh, you know, I, I know that maybe I won't marry. It just seems like a waste of their time and a waste of mine to say nothing about, pleasure having fun growing having a chance to like learn and and like maybe change your mind about something open yourself up to new experiences new worlds new ways of thinking like it's it was so hard for me for a long time to like i honestly i never got comfortable dating you know like i it, it never became fun for me um relationships i i'm all, i i feel very much like um like a serial monogamous, you know, like I've had long-term boyfriends and I have dated multiple people at a time, not in a relationship, but just when I've been single, I have done that. And it rattled me so much. I would feel so guilty of like, oh my God, like, I feel like I'm cheating on all of them. They're cheating. (laughs) We're not together. No one's cheating on anyone, you know, like, but I felt there's still that, that wiring. And like, I remember, um, one of the things that my therapist told me when dating uh, was the obviously first that I could say no, 
Like, and if a guy was going to be an ass about it and be like, oh, get over yourself. I wasn't even asking you out. Like, fuck him. Like, that's not on me. Um, but also like to that, to, what really helped me was driving myself to my own dates. I would not like if a man came and picked me up in his car because I felt trapped. Mm -hmm. um, always being able to show up and leave under my control really helped me learn how to date. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like it, like I, again, it wasn't just to be honest, like there were also sexual experiences that I felt like I couldn't say no to, that I didn't want to have happen. Um, I feel like many, many, that happens to many people. And you know, it like, it happened to me too, you know? Uh, and it, I, I, however, do take a certain amount of responsibility for knowing that people aren't mind readers. I didn't say no. And I have a fawning response. Like there's flight, fight, freeze, fawn. Mm -hmm. There's, I think some other ones too. And you might know more than me, like studying psychology, but like I tend to be a freezer and a fawner. So I could be terrified and having a miserable time and no one would know because on the outside, I'm totally going along with it and performing and acting the way I think someone wants me to act. And inside freaking out and not wanting it, but playing along to it, playing into it, being what mm -hmm. I, sense their fantasy might be because I'm so scared to say no. And I feel like that's so, that's a, that's a tough one. That's such a tough one because it's an unhelpable fear response. Um, and yet it's like not, it, it, I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges that parents, psychologists, teachers that the world has today is what do we do with a fawning response? I think that's um, to be candid like that, I think that's one of the reasons we have so many of these Me Too stories where, where victims are blamed because they didn't say no, is because we don't understand the fawning response. Mm -hmm. um, we don't understand the freeze response. It's like, I don't know. And that, yeah, that's going off on a, on a different tangent. But basically, if anyone needs to, to just just to button up that correlation between purity culture and sexual abuse and the overlap between the two and fear of saying no, just to just to, cause I don't want that just to, like be, be there. I'd like to sort of button it up with, with a little bit of hope um, is the positive side of purity culture being a form of sexual abuse is that it can also be treated. Um, oh yeah. The way that, that sexual abuse victims have learned, ha have received treatment, you know, and not one treatment is going to work for everyone, but that I think is a really, um, beautiful thing that that it is starting to get recognized like sexual and religiously fueled shame and sexuality is starting to get recognized as a legitimate valid like mental health bodily health condition that a lot of people struggle with and suffer from that can be treated and uh, to, to anyone needing like pointers on that I, I, all I can say is like talk to a therapist and specifically ideally one who is religious trauma informed because you'll save yourself so many time of sessions when you don't have to explain your religion um, and why purity was such a big deal. If you can just dive straight in with a therapist who understands it a little bit more and you can find uh, the recovering from religion website or the secular therapy project, like you can find um, resources for this. They are out there. So if anyone, if anyone listening needs to hear that. They're, they're yes. You can take your agency <laughs> back. You can. And what's so interesting is the way that you took your agency back. So mm -hmm. when I find this so like symbolic, so I, we didn't even get into your childhood here. Guys, <laughs> Alice had a wild childhood, okay? I can, a teenagehood. We can spend so much I want to talk to you about. Um, but basically, so you find yourself like in this like spiritually arranged engagement. Yeah. And you're still a tech, legally a child. And um, you have this breakdown with your mom. And she encourages you like you don't have to do this. Like, I'm concerned for you, basically. You don't have to do this. And you break down talking about how you have to do it because you'll go to hell. And I thought it was very interesting because you, like, say that you think that that was one of the first times she realized, like, how much being raised the way you were raised, like, influenced your sense of self and, like, your own agency in life. But anyways, 
I could, I could talk about that separately for an hour. Um, <laughs> uh, so you eventually um, make the decision, you break off the engagement and you basically like black out the experience. And because it's so, it's so, it, it's an, breaking off the engagement is more than just refusing a marriage or breaking up with someone. It is an existential threat. Yeah. And so you break off this engagement and that's one of the first, the one of the most largest, biggest ways that you've taken back agency in, in your entire life, especially because of growing up at the whim of your parents' faith, just whatever they said God was speaking to them, you would go. N total instability for years. No agency in terms of your, your basically anything. Yeah, I didn't feel like I mattered. Exactly. <laughs> in so mattered. many different ways. Yeah. So it's the one of the first times you're taking back agency in this ma massive way. You're saying no to this relationship, but you're actually saying no to God. And so you breaking this relationship, taking back agency by breaking off this relationship was actually taking back your agency from God himself. Like, yeah. and that's <laughs> so how you left your faith. That like, was the first step. Yeah. That was the first major step. To it's so major. Yeah. yeah. And then there's like 17 year old Alice. It's like out in this world. <laughs> <laughs> Poor little me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it was, it truly was the scariest thing I had ever done to this day. That was the scariest thing. And yeah, I did black out. I really can't remember what I said, how it came out of me. Like I, I, I have little snippets of, of that afternoon when I, when I broke up with my fiance and, um, and I lived in utter terror for the entire year following. There was a lot of like, like I took out this part of the book because I had to trim out a lot, but like I had a whole, the chapter that was right after that, after, right after me breaking off my betrothal was a scene where I, it was a few months later and he'd hit me up to get his vacuum back. I guess I still had his vacuum because I bought it. <laughs> and I had told him the one thing I did remember was that I had told him like never to contact me. Like I didn't want to hear mm -hmm. from him again. And so I remember like I was drinking with some friends at a birthday party. And I looked down and I saw like his name on my phone and I was just like, <gasps> you're freaking out. This was like around my 18th birthday. And uh, he left a voicemail like being like, oh, acknowledging like, oh, I know I'm, I know I'm supposed to be getting you space right now, but I really kind of need my vacuum back. And, you know, <laughs> and I have a, okay. Um, and so I was like, I arranged to have a friend go with me to return the vacuum. And uh, it was a guy friend. None of my girlfriends were free. And uh, I, up until that point, I never wanted to go to the city where he lived in. Every time I would have to go there for an audition, I was so on edge. I was like crouching in my seat, afraid that his car might be next to mine. Every time I saw a guy who resembled him on like a sidewalk, I like would literally freeze and hide until I- Oh yeah, you talk about how you have a fear of anyone who has his features. Oh, yeah. Anyone who anyone who even halfway resembled him. Anytime I saw the type of car he drove, terror, like like major major um, triggers going on, and like PTSD like triggers going on. And because um, it wasn't just him, I wasn't scared that he would hurt me. He would never hurt me. I I knew that. I was never scared of him that way. I was scared. He he just came to symbolize my exactly. disobedience to God, and therefore he came to symbolize Satan himself. <laughs> in some weird way. And when I'm sitting, I, so I'm like having to return the vacuum and I'm sitting in this McDonald's booth because we agreed to meet like at a McDonald's and the vacuum's like in my trunk. I'm waiting for him to text me and let me know he's here. My guy friend sitting across from me is like, are you okay? Cause I'm shaking. I'm like shaking teeth chattering, like sick to my stomach. And, and I tell him like, I can't, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do, you're going to have to do it for me. Like, I don't, I can't see him. And I'm having a total meltdown in the McDonald's. I like go to the bathroom and I like to try washing my hands. Cause sometimes cold water on my, on my hands helps calm me down from a panic place. And, uh, 
I remember my friend just looking at me and going like, what did this guy do to you? Because it looked like I was scared that he was going to like beat me or something. And I didn't mean to give that impression, but it validated like, fuck, I have some major trauma going on. Like, and I, my friend returned the vacuum for me. As it turned out, the guy that I was betrothed, my ex-fiance, he hadn't even shown up himself. He'd sent his brother to like do the exchange. <laughs> oh my <laughs> was, God, all so, that for nothing. I didn't know that. Yeah, I know. So like, I oh, was- That's like, relatable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, I was going through this whole thing of like bracing myself to see him. He wasn't even gonna be there, you know? But so I was freaking myself out for nothing as it turned out, but I didn't know that then. And mm -hmm. I remember, um, after it was done and my friend came back and was like, Hey, it's okay. I was like literally hiding in the booth under the table. I didn't even care how, what it looked like. All I knew was that I couldn't see him. And I didn't want him to see me. My friend comes back and he's like, Hey, it's okay. Like he didn't even come. His brother came. He's gone. Like, it's okay. I burst into tears. He walked me to the car. He buckled me in his passenger seat and I just sobbed the whole ride home. And for the rest of that year, like it, I really lived in such a state still of heightened trauma. Um, and I was just waiting for God's punishment to come through. I was just waiting for, I was sure like an earthquake in LA would happen and I'd just get swallowed whole. I was sure that I was gonna get some terminal illness any day now and be diagnosed. I was sure that whenever I did marry, I was never gonna be able to have orgasms with my real husband or maybe I'd be, I wouldn't even be able to have children because I didn't marry the man that God meant for me to marry. I was just so convinced that all of these consequences were gonna befall me and it was, truly terrifying and now i've gotten off topic and i can't remember what the question was or what, how we got here <laughs> no it's fine i think um one thing we should touch on yeah. is um like a big turning point for you so we touched on it in the beginning mm -hmm. but let me pull it up in your book because there was one thing you said that i really really liked so basically this is like um a few, how, how long, the photo shoot scene, how long was that after your, you broke up? That is like right a, a few months. Yeah. Oh, in terms of time, that's like almost a year. That's oh, okay. Like so it's like a year later and basically you get called in to do like a modeling job and you're topless and um, you describe it as this like unexpectedly like um unexpectedly like comfortable and like spiritual experience and um i just want to read a little bit of it is that in that moment i felt like divinity itself woman in all her glory bare and fearless in front of everyone in the studio i felt unleashed liberated the feet and the feeling was overwhelming as fierce as it was delicate and wholly unrepentant then it came to me i knew what it was i I knew what it was I felt. I felt power. And what was power if not the opposite of shame? And then you continue a little bit further. Um, nothing could have prepared me for the potent medicine of rebellion or for the healing power of my sensuality that every religion was threatened by. I had discovered something I had wanted all women to feel. Freedom, guiltlessness, power. No one would take it away from me again. It was as though in that small, significant moment, I forgave myself for being female. And that last sentence, like, took me. I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> like and it's so true. Like, um, that's something that I needed to do or continue to need to do as well. Just like, forgive myself for being a woman. Because as women, we're the ones who have to carry this. Like, we're the ones who have to protect our own honor and the honor of the men as well. Like, so we have we have to carry all of this. And we get cast out more for deviancy, right? Yeah. Like, the, the consequences are way higher. Not that other people don't have consequences, but, like, let's be honest, guys. Um, fellas. You hear me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, I think like learning to like be okay with the fact that like my existence as a woman is not itself shameful, especially as a Christian, like you're raised with like Eve created this original sin and that mm -hmm. lives within women. And so 
like hearing that like other faiths don't have original sin i was like what <laughs> what are yeah. you telling me right now like yeah, yeah it's and and to and to realize like that's actually not mine to carry Ugh. like that's not something that i have to put on myself like that's something that was that was external to me like this isn't actually like a part of who i am i'm not yeah. supposed to like just carry this as yeah. like something i need to constantly protect and then it's closed off and I'm not supposed to touch it and I'm not supposed to like it and I'm not supposed to talk about it. Oh my God, that's so inappropriate. Like, <laughs> no, like yeah. that's shameful. Like, especially even adults in my life seemed uncomfortable with sex, you know, like watching movies with the family, like, you know, if a couple's on screen and they're kissing, like you feel everyone in the room get tense. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so like, just even it's so hard to articulate to people, like even the smallest messages like that as a child, it's not explicit. That's, I think is one thing that's different between you and me. Like there's so much of your experience that you can point to the Bible and say like, this is how specifically it influenced me. Like I didn't really grow up in that environment where we're looking at verses very specifically and you know them very well and all that stuff. It was more just like this cultural feeling and the mood and the way that people talked about things or what they didn't talk about or you know they s turned off very quickly like and it just you're like oh I, this is something that is bad like and i'm supposed to carry this within myself yeah and not ask questions about it and understand even fully why is it bad all i know is like this is taboo and we don't go here you know yeah it's not safe like here and yeah no it's it's interesting i think i think um to one, one observation that I've made in, in the short amount of time that I've been doing the work that I do with Dare to Doubt and just talking to people as a whole throughout my life and our different experiences is um, people who grow up Catholic have, not that it's a shame contest, but I will say to my observation, Catholics- That's what it a, seems like from the outside. A, <laughs> the Catholics ha have, a, have a, a very Catholic relationship to shame that to my observation, again, there's always exceptions, is in my opinion, like a lot heavier and harder to let go of than a lot of other Christian denominations. Um, again, anecdotal, my observation and like uh, through through stories and also through personal relationships and experiences. And, and it's, um, I think, you know, that one moment that I had when I was 15, having to like apologize to all the guys on my mission trip. I imagine growing up that way and apologizing out loud to like a priest in a confession booth, like on the weekly, like that does a number on somebody because at least for the majority of my Christian upbringing, when I sinned in my heart, it could kind of stay in my heart. It could be between me and God. I felt like even though God never talked back to me, I felt like I had a direct access to him and I, I didn't need to co confess out loud and have anyone else know my own internal sins. And I feel like we all, most of us know the power of voicing something positive or negative, the power of the voice and putting breath to words even more than writing. And I'm a writer. I feel very powerful with my words, but when I read my, my own book out loud, it's like, it makes it real. Gutting. It's gutting. And if I look back at trying to imagine if I'd had to say out loud to someone to verbalize and put breath to all of my sins on a regular basis, where then I was like given penance or whatever, whatever Catholics call it, but basically <laughs> whatever you do, penance, whatever you call it, to atone um, for your sin, whatever, say the Hail Marys, do X, Y, Z, whatever, whatever it is. Like I did not have to grow up with that. I grew up with my own things and we all grew up with our own things. Like you said earlier, it's all relative. It's not a contest, it's relative. But I will say to my observation, Catholics have had a harder, seem to have a harder time. It's a, it's a, it's a joke, Catholic guilt, good old Catholic guilt. It's not a funny joke. But it's like, that's how real Especially if you live it. Like, yeah. you know, I can, I can joke about it, but it's like a huge part of my life, you know? And it's and, funny. It kind of reminds me of something my brother said. I can't remember the full context of this conversation, but I was back home visiting. And um, 
I can't remember what we were talking about. My, my little brother was there. We were talking about being raised Catholic. And my brother offhandedly said, he's like, oh, yeah, I mean, if, if, you, have, if you have time to be awake, you have time to be guilty. <laughs> and I remember my dad going, my dad going, what? I didn't teach you that. You learned that at Catholic school. <laughs> Like, <laughs> and it's so funny because it's in those moments where I'm like, no, I, I completely, I was a hundred percent there with my brother. I'm like, yeah, what are you talking about? What he's completely right. But then you sit there and I'm like, I actually don't know how, where this comes from that explicitly. Like, where did mm -hmm. I absorb this? Was this Catholic school? Was this from my mm -hmm. family unit? Was this from church groups? Like I can't as easily identify it. So Sure. it's it's so and then I feel like in my adolescence I think I maybe pinned too much of it on my parents you know <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, who hasn't <laughs> yeah I was like yeah. yeah and now I'm like wait I, was it all them I don't know um yeah but I think learning and I, this is obviously very female centric but maybe you could spin it to just be more like I I forgive myself for like being a human yeah and, like, and having these desires like yeah. that's it's worthwhile and it's there's so much joy on the other side of it i yeah. think that that's what needs to be emphasized is there's so much like fun yeah. on the other side of it <laughs> freedom freedom from all freedom from guilt freedom from mental hang-ups freedom from having to come up with excuses to justify behavior freedom from your own self-policing and your hyper vigilance and and shame you know there's there's so much freedom and for some people it can it can come very naturally and they don't have symptoms of religious trauma and for other people there's a spectrum right you know like for other people it's just debilitating. Um, and, and I think that uh, everyone finds their own way through it. But I do think the journey to my experience is so worth it. It was so hard, so hard. It's still hard sometimes, you know, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I would not yeah. try to go back to a sexless, existence where I didn't even feel like I existed. I would never yeah. go back to dying to myself on the daily because I was supposed to, because denying my flesh, like I would never want to go back to that living in fear. I would rather deal with the panic attacks and PTSD, like symptoms of religious trauma, knowing that I really am safe now. I'm okay now. Even if my body doesn't know it yet, and we're still like reacting this way. I know there's still a part of me that even in the midst of my worst panic attack, could know that I'm okay now though. I'm okay, I'm safe. You know, I don't have to live under that mentality anymore, which just made me want to die. Um, and, and that I think, you know, again, we're, we happen to be like um, Americans who, who have that luxury of being able to like leave our religion and live freely and, and date, you know, like so mm -hmm. many people as, as you intimately know, like don't have, that, that luxury of being able to even say that they're thinking about leaving their religion. And I cherish that deeply. Um, I, you know, I, I, as I'm sure you do too, like I hear from people in um, certain Muslim majority countries where it's like illegal, you know, to be an apostate and, and they're anonymous and they're so scared of someone finding their Instagram account. We, you know, just the other day, that girl got stabbed by her brother for having a TikTok account. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, this Howdy, kind of, I think, yeah, this kind of stuff happens. So I recognize that not everyone's going to be able to like break free and walk away and find healing the way that, um, that I've been lucky to, and that many other people are lucky to, but, um, I do encourage whatever freedom of thought you can find, even if it's just freedom of thought, like, oh, it's, I don't know. I, th I feel like for, for a lot of people, it no longer becomes a choice. I know for me, faith and leaving my faith didn't feel like a choice. I wouldn't have chosen to leave. It just was. I couldn't, den I couldn't deny that God just wasn't real to me. I couldn't deny that anymore. And yeah, I gave him the test and he failed and affirmed it. <laughs> um, but it, it was like, a, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that I know not everyone is able to find healing in a lot of the ways that we're talking about right now. But yeah. whoever you can find it, like, 
however you can find it. I hope there's online cool. communities <laughs> like Atheist Republic. <laughs> there um, are. <laughs> but speaking of freedom of thought, that was actually the perfect segue to talk about what you do at Dare to Doubt. So guys, <laughs> I provided all the info below. Make sure to check out Dare to Doubt. So Dare to Doubt is your resource site. Will you please tell us a little bit about it? Yes. So dare to doubt.org. Um, I, two years ago, I started this resource site because um, I, I started with the intention of making it just a little bit easier for people who were, uh, who had left or were thinking of leaving their religion to find help. Um, and it's, it's just me running it. So it's not as big and robust and diverse as I would like it to one day be, but I do have resources for eight different spiritual backgrounds um, uh, from Christianity to Mormonism, Scientology, Islam, and like Eastern religion. I, 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 I combined a lot of the Eastern religious ones into one group, um, specifically like a, uh, under that umbrella would be things like transcendental meditation um, or you know, yoga cults, <laughs> things that fall under sort of an Eastern mysticism vibe that end up being very toxic. There's <laughs> transcendental <laughs> meditation. Guys, you don't know this. TM is really bad. It's, it's not good. Scary. Yeah. It's not good. No. And it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it makes me very nervous the way few other religions quite make me nervous because it's like meditation even in the secular world meditation is looked at as like a good thing i get triggered really badly by meditation but especially transcendental meditation it's like for a good own, reason for good reason it's its own thing um but yeah dare to doubt like it, it basically you can so you can search for resources based on your spiritual background if it's there like i said it's still growing or you can search by some of your more immediate needs. Like I have what's a, a mental health page where you, it has resources where you can find, try to find a therapist in your area or a peer support group in your area. Um, I have a crisis care page where like, say you just got kicked out of the house for something and uh, you're needing a place to sleep or maybe you're f fleeing honor-based violence um, or the threat of such. Like there's domestic shelters that, you, again, there's some resources that'll try to help point, get at least give you a starting point to um, research where you can go to find safety and support and help. Um, and there's also like some fun resources to like podcasts and books and like Atheist Republic is actually one of the very first things I added. Um, <laughs> it is like I, so I, I built this site primarily for my younger self, which mm -hmm. needed secular resources. And those are really hard to find in my experience. Um, it's getting easier now, but I also have added some resources that I call faith friendly because I think it's important for me to, um, because I've also been here too, to, for people who are just dipping a toe outside their faith, like maybe they're just beginning to question, maybe they'll never leave it at all. I still wanted to, to have some resources for them that would not necessarily make fun of their their faith. Like I like I, I was saying earlier, uh, I happen to quite like the angry atheism that makes fun of faith, <laughs> but I also recognize that that can be very alienating to a lot of people and to my myself. What my younger self, when I was starting to question, when I was just in the early stages of detaching from evangelical Christianity, if I'd come across a website like Dare to Doubt and it was just only secular things, I wouldn't have found some of the help that I needed. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to include some resources there that were faith friendly too. Um, and yeah, like that's that's basically Dare to Doubt and why I started it. Um, it's something that I, it's my, my passion project. Uh, no one pays me to do it. I, I'm very like, it's, that's why it's like, it's all as I have time to put into it. I do. Um, but I just, I'm so grateful for the chance to like highlight these other important organizations and fun peer support groups and books and movies um, that can all help facilitate making sense of and healing from and releasing a belief system that may have come to feel harmful to you in one way, shape or form, maybe in its entirety. For me, 
it all felt in retrospect pretty harmful <laughs> but i understand you know god was never real to me the way he was to some people maybe some aspects of their faith are still dear to them you know so it's it's a we all end up in different places no one healing journey is the same as someone else's so yeah yeah i hope that that's one thing <laughs> i really like about dare to doubt and it's something that we really promote here at atheist republic is like um we're not even trying to get everyone to leave their faith like that's not even really a goal but like normalizing doubt yes. is definitely a goal of ours it's definitely yes. something we promote it's like you don't even you could still be a believer but just like is it okay within yourself to doubt like is is it okay within your community maybe like because that's actually a sign of a healthy community that they can withstand yeah. doubts and criticisms one but yeah. Also, like, d is skepticism okay? Can, are you, do you allow yourself to think critically? So, like, you, the whole, guys, go check out Dare to Doubt. Armin put the link in the live chat. Um, it's really cool. I really liked the resources that you had available. And I was like, this is so on target. <laughs> it's just so on target. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I loved it. Well, we went, like, way later than I told you we would. So yes, it's totally <laughs> fine. It's totally fine. This has been my absolute pleasure chatting. With yes. You. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, so much fun. I feel like I could talk to you for like so much longer. <laughs> uh, you're always welcome to come back. But Thank guys, you. make sure you go check out Wayward by Alice. <laughs> this is pronounced Gretchen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Link is in the description. And if you prefer stuff in audiobooks, that's coming to you soon. Yep. This spring it'll be it'll be released. I'm I'm doing all the finishing touches now, like the mastering's being done. I'm figuring out logistics, like distribution and things like that. But it will be coming out later on this spring, hopefully within the next month or two. Um, and yeah, I'll be announcing it on all of my social media sites, my website. So you can just follow up there if you prefer to get your books through audio. It's like a booming, booming little sub industry within, within. Yes. And it's, oh, yeah. and not only is it endorsed by me, it's endorsed by our very own board member, Ali Rizvi. Yeah. So you know, it's good. Okay. <laughs> Guys, get in, it, get into it. Yes, <laughs> oh, look good. at the live chat. Everyone's like. <laughs> <laughs> oh hi Armin, I see your comments. <laughs> Aww. Aww, you guys are so sweet. <laughs> um well thank you so much for joining this, Alice. I so loved talking to you. Oh, thank you so much, Suzanne. I love talking with you too. This was such a good conversation. You know, it's one of the few conversations I've had with another another female who I just know we can relate on some different different levels. And so this was this was a treat for me. Thank you so much. Atheist women unite. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Bye guys. Bye. <laughs>